All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina Capesti, and I lead our policy and program analysis branch at NHGRI. And I am here to welcome you today on behalf of NHGRI to the second annual Louise M. Slaughter National DNA Day Lecture. This lecture is named after Congresswoman Louise Slaughter because 16 years ago, she led a group of legislators who passed a concurrent resolution creating National DNA Day to celebrate the completion of the Human Genome Project, as well as the 50th anniversary of this discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. Last year, sadly, Mrs. Slaughter passed away after a barrier-breaking career dedicated to science and public service. She was one of the earliest champions of genomics on Capitol Hill and a steadfast advocate for policies that have allowed genomics research to advance to the point where it's at today, including the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, also known as GINA. This lecture serves as a reminder of the groundbreaking individual and the importance of science in our everyday lives. And now I'll hand it over to Carla Easter of our education branch to introduce our speaker. So thank you, Christina. Uh, so I want to say again, thank you all for coming. Welcome to the annual DNA Day lecture. As Christina said, we felt it was important to pay homage to our Representative Slaughter. And I cannot think of a better way to do that than by introducing and having our speaker uh, provide you with a presentation today. So we, uh, we being the DNA Day Committee, spent a long time thinking about what type of speaker we wanted. And in the past, DNA Day has been the kind of opportunity to show how much fun doing research around genetics and genomics and DNA can be. And so I have to say personally, when uh, Roseanne brought the bio of our speaker to me, I was so excited. And my only question was, can we get him? Because uh, when you hear him speak, you'll see uh, how in demand he is. And I have had the opportunity to spend this morning and this afternoon with him. And uh, I have decided that we are going to adopt him and ask him to come and work in the education and community involvement branch, um, if he'll have us. Uh, but anyway, a little bit about uh, Dr. David Kong. Uh, Dr. Kong received a master's degree in nanotechnology and a PhD in synthetic biology from MIT. He is the director of the MIT's Media Lab, and he has been recognized as an emerging leader in synthetic biology as a LEAP Fellow and serves as a guest faculty member at the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole. Um, in addition to all of these amazing things, because uh, I could go on and on with his accolades, I just want to bring up the fun stuff that he does. Um, he has performed as a DJ, a beatboxer, vocalist, and rapper at hundreds of venues, including South by Southwest, the Staples Center in Los Angeles, the Brooklyn Bowl, and he has also opened for Tonight Show band leader and hip hop legend Questlove, which this is awesome. Uh, he is also an award winning vocal arranger and producer, and his photography has been exhibited at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian, the Japanese American National Museum, and other museums and galleries across the country. He is truly a Renaissance man. And I cannot tell you how pleased and excited that I am that he agreed to give today's lecture called Crossing Cultures, an Exploration of Microbial Music and Community Bio Movement. So with no further delay, I introduce Dr. David S. Kong. All right, everyone, um, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you all. And um, please, um, uh, let me, let me uh, graciously accept that adoption offer. Um, I, I, I completely accept, and I'm excited to be a part of the, the family here at NHGRI. Um, I've just had such an amazing uh, morning and early afternoon with so many of you folks here. Meeting you all actually has been um, really just the highlight of my, my trip. And um, it's really an honor to meet you all and be so inspired by, by all of you. Um, so, um, 
As was mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a synthetic biologist. Uh, I'm also a community organizer and an artist. So uh, part of what we'll be talking about today in terms of thinking about crossing cultures is also the intersection between science and engineering, uh, but also uh, the arts and also design, right? I think all of those modes of creativity are really, really important. Um, before I, I dive in, though, I did wanted to, uh, um, again, just acknowledge and uh, really, really, um, I, again, it's such an honor to be speaking uh, in uh, for, on this lecture that was named after Representative Slaughter. Um, as I was mentioned earlier, I've been just learning a little bit about the impact that Representative Slaughter had on uh, not just genomics, but on, on uh, science broadly, and uh, her work in um, securing the first 500 million by Congress for breast cancer research, the NIH Revitalization Act, uh, the Office of Research on Women's Health, and the NIH, which was established through her, uh, her work. Um, and again, as was mentioned, the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which for myself as a community organizer and a social justice activist um, is, is really critical and important. Uh, and along with, again, uh, work like the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, uh, which has been uh, really employed effectively to try to counter some of the threats of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So uh, it's a real honor to be able to speak here um, at, a, at a lecture named after Representative Slaughter, and, and I really want to acknowledge her and, and all of the impact that she's had on, on, uh, uh, on genomics and society. And so, uh, again, um, I uh, come from the Media Lab at MIT, and I should say, uh, just so in case anybody at the Media Lab is, is watching, I'm actually not the director of the Media Lab. That's Joey Ito, who's my boss. <laughs> so, but I, I direct, but, I, but I'm very privileged, though, to direct a, 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 an in initiative within the Media Lab called the Community Bio Initiative, which I'll talk more about. Uh, and the Media Lab is a really wonderful place. Uh, if you all have come to Boston, I, I encourage you to come and come and stop by and visit us. Uh, we've got a huge selection of different types of research groups that explore uh, a huge range of different types of areas of, again, art, science, design, and also engineering. Um, this was a, a, a diagram created by my colleague at the lab, Aniri Oxman, which is the Krebs Cycle of Creativity, uh, which talks about uh, the interplay between these four domains. And again, I think, um, you know, especially as we, we move forward with science and, uh, and the life sciences, um, thinking about how art can engage with science and design and engineering all connect together, I think, is a, is a big part of the future. And so at the lab, uh, folks like Neary um, has worked at the interface of uh, biological design, so thinking about how we can be inspired by the living world and employ those insights into designing uh, architecture and the built world. Uh, my colleague uh, Hiroshi Ishii, uh, who leads the Tangible Media Group, has made uh, these incredible materials that include uh, spores, actually, that are responsive to, um, in this case, a dancer's um, perspiration, so smart materials. Uh, my colleague uh, Hugh Herr uh, has a uh, um, uh, leads a group called the Biomechatronics Group, and uh, he himself, of course, uh, has the prosthetics and has been really uh, doing research at the forefront of human aug augmentation through, uh, through these different types of mechanical structures. Uh, my colleague Ed Boyden leads the Synthetic Neurobiology Group and explores um, basically the frontiers of the brain and human consciousness and has developed some really remarkable technologies to help us understand uh, the brain and even map the brain. And in uh, my group's work, uh, we've also explored things like microfluidics or lab on a chip technology, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and the whole idea of being able to miniaturize entire uh, chemical and biological processes into tiny chips that you could potentially even hold in your hand uh, in a mobile format. So there's a lot of really exciting work happening at the lab, and uh, one of the big themes we explore at the Media Lab is this idea of anti-disciplinary uh, research, which again, I think is an important um, idea to think about in the future of innovation and the future of the life sciences. And so anti-disciplinary research is the idea that the cool stuff actually happens in between the disciplines, right? So uh, there might be biology and chemistry, and interdisciplinary research might be the, the chemist and the biologist working together, but actually the anti-disciplinary notion is the exploration of all the white space in between the disciplines. And I know for myself, um, as a synthetic biologist and a community organizer, um, it was really a, a wonderful thing to find a home and a place like the Media Lab where I could do my work. Another key idea we explore a lot at the lab is this idea of innovation at the edge. So what happens when technology becomes accessible and very, very diverse communities can start participating? Um, and so again, you know, that's a big part of, I think, of a lot of the uh, research groups at the lab and what we work on, and certainly in the initiative that I leave at the lab. And so um, what I work on, again, uh, in leading this community bio uh, initiative is sort of the intersection of three different areas. So one part is community organizing and movement building. And, and again, I'll, I'll share a little bit more later, but that's a big part of, uh, in my career, I've spent a lot of time working and uh, organizing different types of communities. Um, another part is around collective intelligence and social science. So actually studying the way that communities and crowds can drive innovation. And then the third part is really on technology development. So actually inventing uh, really accessible, low-cost biotechnologies that can be used globally uh, to empower this grassroots-driven movement in the life sciences, uh, sometimes referred to as community bio. 
And so part of what we believe is that the emergent power of these decentralized, diverse communities augmented with digital tools and democratized biotechnologies can really drive disruptive innovations in life sciences and inspire creativity and improve lives. So that's a big part of what we work on. And, um, and it's a real pleasure to work with uh, all of these wonderful young people that are part of uh, uh, the initiative over the years. Um, and so again, I learned so much from uh, all of the different group members that I've had the real pleasure of working with. And so um, today, uh, I'll be talking about a, a lot of different topics, and, and I really want to pay homage to this idea of a, of a National DNA Day. What an awesome idea. I love so much that there is one, and that, uh, and I, uh, that, that the uh, NHGRI has been leading this. And I also want to give a big shout out to the organizers of DNA Day and also this lecture. So uh, Roseanne and Chiara and to Sharice, thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Um, Again, uh, I, I'm an organizer myself, and it's one of those things I know. For me, you know, I just show up here and I'm giving this talk, but the organizers are really the ones that do all of the work and really uh, should be the ones getting all the credit. So, so thank you all for all, the, all of your hard work. And so in acknowledging this kind of idea of crossing cultures, I wanted to start actually by giving a little shout out to DNA in culture today. So um, again, uh, I'm a person that's really interested in, uh, and I love hip hop, I love DJing and, and so on. Um, I don't know y'all if y'all know who this is, this, this image refers to. Does anybody in this room know who, who these people are? Maybe it's maybe, maybe an idea. So um, this is a boy band called BTS. They are a major, major Korean uh, pop group uh, taking over the whole world, and one of their big hit songs is called DNA. So shout outs to BTS on DNA Day. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, one of my favorite artists, uh, the legendary Kendrick Lamar. Some of you may be familiar with his, his track, also called DNA. Um, so, so I point out BTS and, and Kendrick um, in part because I'm a big fan of their work, but also because I think there is a really intimate connection between um, science and innovation and culture, right? So this is a quote from uh, Franklin Foer who says that you know, innovations don't magically appear or simply proceed on the basis of some scientific knowledge. The culture prods them into existence, right? Which I think is a very powerful idea. Um, we were talking earlier about this idea that, you know, could we think of the Hamilton for, for science and genomics, right? How could we make a really broad cultural impact? And uh, uh, much like Hamilton has for, for history, you know, could we think of something similar in the sciences? And, and I think, and I hope that we really can, because I think that's a big part of how we can really ensure that science uh, belongs to, to communities all around the world and get those folks excited and activated. And so when we think about DNA, um, and again in my field, which is uh, synthetic biology, um, there's a really you know, kind of key history, right? So recombinant DNA technology, um, I'll start there, there's a lot of history about DNA before that, but I think recombinant DNA technology is an important historical moment where um, using different types of proteins or enzymes, uh, we're able to uh, basically manipulate DNA molecules and being able to cut them, being able to copy them and work with them. But again, a key point here I think is always working with molecules found from nature, right? So one of the kind of critical technologies that's been driving uh, the field that I've been uh, really grown up in, which is synthetic biology, Biology is DNA synthesis, which is the idea that we could design in a computer an arbitrary sequence of DNA molecules and literally have a machine called the DNA synthesizer that takes the DNA bases, the A, G, C's, and T's, and essentially can print an arbitrary sequence of DNA, a molecule that has never before existed in nature, right? And this is, I think, when we reflect back on this era, um, we'll, we'll look back at DNA synthesis as one of the major, major foundational technologies of our time. Um, in my own research, uh, and again, a big shout out to NIH who funded a big part of my own uh, graduate research, um, I worked on building uh, a type of a lab on a chip or microfluidic system to miniaturize the process of assembling gene length DNA constructs. Um, and so again, uh, I, certainly my research couldn't have been, been done without the NIH, so I'm personally very grateful. Um, and when we think about DNA, right, um, there's a, a whole spectrum of DNA that, that we might want to consider. And so, uh, again, in, in my work, um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about individual genes, which might be hundreds or maybe like a thousand base pairs in length. Um, but increasingly, over the past couple of years, I've been working on uh, a type of DNA, uh, uh, basically larger constructs that you could call a genetic circuit, right, which has not just individual genes, but many genes and other types of biological parts that could be included together. And moving up uh, another order of magnitude to hundreds of thousands of base pairs, we start getting into investigations of, uh, of minimal life, right? So mycoplasma genitalium has got 580,000 base pairs and is the, uh, um, is the smallest genome for a, a known self-replicating organism. And then all the way up to the complete rewrite of uh, bacterial genomes at millions of base pairs. So, and, and again, I think critically here, um, already to date, uh, researchers have been able to build synthetic DNA molecules going up to even millions of base pairs, which is a really an incredible accomplishment. And so, again, uh, you know, connected very much to the history of the NIH and a lot of the work done here, um, we have, uh, we have 
uh, one of the core principles of molecular biology, which is the central dogma, DNA being transcribed into RNA and then ultimately being translated into protein, which is a, which is a key insight which has uh, much of synthetic biology is built on top of. And so one of the key ideas, I think, in synthetic biology, which has been really exciting, is this basically experiment in mapping a metaphor which is this metaphor of engineering, the idea that could we actually engineer a cell the same way we could engineer a computer, right? It's, it was a very interesting uh, type of, of question that a lot of the early folks in synthetic biology were asking. And this was a paper from uh, uh, Nature in 2000 by Elowitz and Lieber that was basically demonstrated the first uh, repressilator, it was called, which was essentially um, a, 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 series of, a, a, a series of different plasmids that uh, when injected into a cell, um, behaved much like a ring oscillator from electronics. So over time, if you monitor the expression of, uh, of a fluorescent protein that's tagged to one of these, uh, the expression of one of these three proteins, TADR, LAC, or lambda, um, you can actually see this oscillatory function which looks a lot like a ring oscillator from electronics, which is a really amazing thing, right? So this is one of the first uh, kind of uh, 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 bits of evidence that shows that we could actually uh, potentially program a cell like we could program a computer. And now, at places like MIT um, and labs all around the world, uh, folks are working on, on things like genetic circuits. So again, you can see this kind of very intentional mapping of these engineering principles onto a biological system. So the idea that you can employ, for example, digital Boolean logic, you can see over here this kind of code at the top, which, which and again, all of, these, um, all of these symbols here represent different DNA elements. And the code that's running in a cell with this genetic circuit asks if, that, if these two microRNAs are present at a high concentration and if these three microRNAs are present at a low concentration, if all of those conditions are satisfied, then this is a cancer cell. Okay, so this is a, a type of a, a classifier that could be used and, an, and a way to apply um, these genetic circuits inside cells. And so, you know, this is a, a picture that I love from Technology Review um, that shows this bacteria that has all of these, you know, cool, uh, like a potentiostat and all of these other uh, kind of circuitry. And, and the idea is to really think explicitly about this metaphor of, of engineering uh, the living world. Um, my my uh, uh, colleague and uh, the founder of the Media Lab, uh, Nicholas Negroponte, um, has been saying over the past couple of years this idea that biotech is the new digital. Nicholas is very famous for making a lot of predictions about the future, uh, specifically as it related to digital technologies and the ways that the internet would impact society and the world. And um, I think what Nicholas is really referring to here is the impact that biotechnologies and the life sciences will increasingly have on society. And so we're really in this very interesting historical moment. And if you look at synthetic biology, there's a lot of really key and exciting areas, I think, that, that people are, are starting to make innovations in. So one is this notion that cells could be engineered to actually produce stuff, right? That you could actually uh, make all kinds of different materials, chemicals, uh, different types of fuel, or, or other types of, uh, of, of compounds could be produced through uh, biological engineering. So this is a, 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 a image showing the different metabolic pathways in plants. And the idea, idea here is that you can take one compound and essentially modify it through biochemical reactions to produce another type of uh, compound. And so nature has produced this incredible array of these different products. And one of the big goals in synthetic biology is to figure out, can we actually leverage these incredible metabolic pathways in nature and engineer them to make stuff uh, that's designed by humans? And so uh, we've been able to do a lot of really powerful things from producing, again, different types of chemicals and fuels. Uh, my friends and colleagues over at Ginkgo Bioworks, um, which again, it's a very important synthetic biology company. Um, they started out engineering organisms to produce different types of uh, flavors and fragrances and increasingly are working uh, in, in chemicals and other types of therapeutics. And so, so Ginkgo, again, I, I think is really one of the uh, interesting companies in synthetic biology. And their tagline is the organism is the product, right? So this is a, just a sense of kind of where, where Ginkgo is. Um, I mentioned before this idea that we can introduce a genetic circuit inside a cell and that the cell, uh, based on a computation, could decide could know whether it's cancer and, and, and based on if it is, actually destroy that cell. Another really exciting area of research is this idea of cell-based therapeutics, right? We're used to being able to take uh, um, different types of, uh, of medicines that have been produced chemically, um, or even biologically, if you take insulin, for example, but this whole idea that a cell could be a therapeutic itself and that it could be installed into the body and could potentially directly sense and respond to disease is a really amazing idea. And so, again, we're starting to see all of these wonderful advances um, and also, increasingly, different types of commercial products that um, are starting to impact our everyday life. So some of you may be familiar with this idea of cellular agriculture, uh, being able to grow animal products without uh, having to actually kill any animals. So using bioreactors, essentially, to, 
uh, to grow these different types of, of uh, food products or being able to leverage uh, different bacteria uh, to produce materials that could be used for fashion, right? So this is the work of uh, Suzanne Lee from Modern Meadow, um, which is really cool. Um, some colleagues in, uh, in the Bay Area have started a company called Bolt Threads, and the idea here is to actually be able to synthesize a material like spider silk, which has incredible materials, but using uh, uh, biology to do it. So be, basically being able to use uh, bioreactors and being able to grow these materials in the lab. Um, I think one of the scariest things that I could possibly imagine is uh, a spider farm where you would actually have to harvest the spider silk from spiders. That terrifies me. So I'm very grateful that Bolt Threads has figured out a way to do this uh, in, a, in a bioreactor. Um, one of the more um, really kind of uh, mind-blowing aspects or, or applications of, uh, of synthetic biology is this idea of gene drives. So uh, my colleague Kevin Esbelt at the Media Lab has been working on a type of technology which is, which is actually a very um, a clever application of CRISPR, Cas9, which I think uh, many of you are familiar with, which is a very precise genome editing technology. And the idea is by using the CRISPR, the CRISPR machinery in conjunction with a trait that one might want to engineer in a population of organisms, let's say you're interested in, um, in ridding uh, a, a population of mosquitoes from malaria, um, you can use basically uh, this, this gene drive and through rounds of sexual reproduction, the engineered trait is basically propagated or driven through a wild population of organisms. So after multiple rounds of sexual reproduction, um, all of the offspring will have the uh, genetically engineered trait. So we're literally talking about the ability of being able to sculpt a, an ecosystem, which is a really profound, uh, a profound idea, right? And so as we think about the impact of these, these technologies, uh, you know, one question, again, we're, we're all, many of you us here are science nerds here at the NIH, and, I, and I'm sure many of you uh, um, on the internet watching as well. And so what are some of these tools that we can actually use to engineer the living world? Um, I'm from Lexington, Massachusetts, which is a very historic uh, town. Um, each year we celebrate uh, and reenact the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which occurred in 1775. Um, each year there's this vocal contingent that's rooting for the Redcoats, right? Um, each year they're sorely disappointed when the Redcoats lose, right? Um, but, but this is a historical reenactment, and, and there's a scene, I think, um, you know, this was uh, uh, when I was uh, teaching at Woods Hole over one summer of students there, and, um, and this maybe uh, will become a historical enactment as well in the future. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you look at the first, pet, uh, the first pipette patent from 1916, right, um, not a lot has changed, shockingly, in 100 years, right? If you compare that with the advances that we've had in information technology, um, there's a lot that we can do, I believe, in the instrumentation side to make uh, biology in the living world easier to engineer. And so, as I mentioned, uh, one area that I've done a lot of research in is microfluidics, or lab-on-a-chip technology, which basically involves working at length scales of, uh, you know, of fractions of a millimeter and smaller. So uh, uh, the width of a human hair is about 100 microns, which is a very typical feature size in microfluidics. A nanoliter, which is a volume that we work very closely with in microfluidics, might be around the volume that you'd see on the printed period on a, on a, pa on a sheet of paper. A microliter is sort of like a little droplet of fluid that uh, one might work with in a lab. And if you get down even smaller than that, this is a, uh, an image of a human cell, and so this is about a picoliter, so a thousand times smaller than a nanoliter, and this cell has been infected by bacteria, by this is chlamydia, I believe, and these are a thousand times smaller than a picoliter, okay? So, so basically, these are all the different size scales we work with in, in fluidics, so this is a femtoliter. And you can do some really cool things with these devices, right? So you can create these uh, um, little pumps and channels to manipulate these fluids, and really the goal is to try to make a, a lab on a chip, a make a device that actually can miniaturize a lot of these chemical and biological processes. And you can make cool mixing devices. Um, each one of these uh, little, little um, features here is a valve that is, uh, is basically oscillating up and down to mix these fluids together. Um, I mentioned before some of the previous work uh, from my own PhD on miniaturizing gene synthesis. Um, in, my, my, in my time at Lincoln Laboratory, which is where I was before uh, I was at the Media Lab, we collaborated with uh, Professor Ron Weiss from MIT to miniaturize key sets of biochemistries that were used to build genetic circuits. So ligation, gateway, Gibson, and golden gate, these are different types of uh, biochemical processes for making very, very big pieces of DNA. And of course, uh, this work was funded by the NIH, so again, very, very grateful to the NIH for, for their support over the years. And so we built a really cool system. This is an open source hardware tool that allows you to basically execute uh, arbitrary oper uh, operations in one of these microfluidic devices. 
And so this is a paper we published in uh, Nature Biotechnology uh, um, two years ago. And part of what's cool about microfluidics is that you can scale easily, right? So going from one reaction to tens of reactions to even hundreds of reactions, and maybe uh, you know, someday in the future being able to execute something like 100,000 reactions in a type of a device, right? Another format that we worked a lot with in a lab is this idea of droplet microfluidics. So being able to encapsulate, for example, fluorescent bacteria and uh, have those uh, be little, uh, little um, uh, droplets where you can run different types of experiments. So this is an example of a very high frequency droplet generator, very monodiverse droplets that you can um, operate at around a kilohertz frequency, so 1,000 droplets per second. And so, as I've mentioned, um, we can use these tools in a variety of ways, right? Um, I've talked a little bit already about the idea of being able to classify a cell type based on the presence of uh, different types of microRNAs in a cell. And again, microRNAs are, are again, another type of nucleic acid, um, but in this context, really interesting because by just looking at a handful of these microRNAs, and if you have a sense of their approximate concentration, they can act sort of like a cellular fingerprint and tell you what kind of cell it is, right? So going back to this, this genetic circuit, and the idea that if you put these classifier circuits into a heterogeneous population of cells, some are cancer and some are not cancer, um, the, the classifier will help identify the cancer cells and then initiate apoptosis and kill the cell. And so we worked with, um, with uh, Professor Rice's group to try and leverage microfluidics as a way to build libraries of these types of genetic circuits, right, in a manufacturing process. Another project, uh, another application of these types of fluidic tools is in protein engineering. So, uh, for example, if you were interested in trying to understand or engineer a protein that could break down a toxin in the environment, one might want to actually produce many, many versions of that protein and test them. And so one of the really cool ways you can use microfluidics is actually as a prototyping system. So what we did was we worked with call, uh, what's called in vitro transcription translation, which is basically like cell lysate or cell guts. You cut, cut, open, the, uh, um, cut open a cell and take out the, the, uh, the lysate inside, and all of the machinery for uh, transcription and translation, the central dogma of biology, is all present inside that cell lysate. And you can introduce that into the microfluidic device, and basically each one of these dots that's shown here is a different protein design. Right? And so by introducing this in vitro transcription translation mix, you can express many of these proteins in parallel. And the idea is ultimately to assess whether or not each of these proteins is functioning well um, using fluorescence. And so um, this again was some of the work that was done uh, by myself and colleagues at, at Lincoln Laboratory a number of years ago. Um, the third example I'll share is around the microbiome. So I know, again, uh, there are folks here that, that are very interested in microbiome research. It's one of my favorite areas of science right now. And so, um, how can we ultimately work with uh, these fluidic tools and uh, with the human microbiome? Um, again, a few facts about the microbiome. I, I know we have a lot of folks here that are probably pretty knowledgeable, but um, I, I think there's some really interesting ones. So um, one, one really key idea is that we just have an incredible amount of organisms that are part of the body, right? So uh, if you add up the total mass of these, of these organisms, these microorganisms, you might end up with you know, several pounds of, of bacteria and microorganisms, which actually has a similar mass uh, to the human brain. Right? So some uh, microbiologists refer to the microbiome as uh, the lost organ because of how significant it is. Um, and again, uh, you know, just in the intestine, we've got hundreds of trillions of microorganisms. And the colon, this is always a fun fact you know, before or after any meal uh, to think about, um, is actually the, the densest source of microorganisms in the entire biosphere. So 10 to 11 to 10 to the 12 cells per mil in the colon. Right? Um, and so, you know, we've got around 30 trillion human cells, right? I'm curious, uh, for fo even folks in the audience, how many bacterial cells do you think we have if you count every single one of them? Any, any guesses? We must, we, we're at the NIH, so I know somebody knows. Was it? Like 30 trillion the third or fourth power. So, so the answer actually is, so you're, the, that order of magnitude is, is, I think, close for the next question I was going to ask, but uh, it's about 40 trillion. Okay, so, so again, you're, you're definitely more uh, microbial than, than human if you count up all the cells. Uh, from a genetic perspective, though, um, you know, again, we've got around uh, 20,000 human genes in the human genome, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the follow-up question is how many genes are represented in the human microbiome? And again, and I think the answer to this one is a little bit closer to what you were saying, which is several orders of magnitude more, right? Um, you know, we humans are these superorganisms that have, you know, around 20,000 human genes in our genome, and then, um, and then uh, you know, 2 to 20 million environmentally acquired genes from our microbiome, right? So the microbiome plays this incredible role in, uh, in regulating and uh, influencing so many aspects of human health and development, from important disease states to uh, cognition and mood, the, the bidirectional gut-brain axis is one of the more exciting areas of, of microbiome science. 
And so much of this, been, this research has been made possible uh, through sequencing, right? And again, uh, you know, it's such an honor to be here at the NIH where uh, the Human Genome Project and also the, the Human Microbiome Project, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, have been so heavily impacted. Uh, this is one of the uh, um, really uh, great images that I love from Richard Wintel showing um, three eras or three eras of DNA sequencing technology, from Sanger sequencing to capillary sequencing and now next generation sequencing. And so, um, with metagenomics, which again is I think one of the real incredible technology revolutions of our time, we're able to, in a very high throughput way, analyze just uh, the, the, the genomic DNA from communities of microorganisms, which could be uh, found environmentally or again inside the gut. And, and again, um, you know, one of the projects that I'm so inspired by is the Human, uh, the human Microbiome Project where uh, researchers um, identified uh, several hundred healthy humans and basically um, uh, sampled and looked at 18 different sites of the body to try and understand and, uh, and study their, their, um, their sequences. And so um, some of the results, I think, are, are so amazing. Um, you know, again, this, this is an image showing, uh, this is from Rob Knight, uh, where each one of these, these dots represents a different type of microbial community. And what the researchers found was that um, there was similar, there, that there was great similarity basically between uh, um, the, the metagenomes found in uh, similar body types. And one of the insights here, which I think is really, really poetic, is the idea that, um, that, the, that if you look, for example, at the oral microbiome and uh, something like the fecal microbiome, that they're as different as places in the biosphere like a coral reef and um, the plains. Right? So, so we humans, we actually are this incredible ecosystem of organisms. And, um, and it's something that we're not always conscious of, but I think is a really incredible fact. And so there are folks that have been really thinking about this and thinking about how do we design and how do we introduce these other uh, layers of creativity. So this is a really great tech talk that I love uh, talking about um, uh, the ways that in which the built environment actually have different microbiomes within buildings. And could we actually leverage that uh, and, and design for that? Another project that's come out of MIT uh, from some colleagues is this idea of underworld. So being able to study the microbiome of a city, right, through the sewer system. If we we're actually able to uh, monitor and uh, sample the microbiome in different parts of a city, then we could actually have a sense um, and get a lot of insight for, for public health applications, right? And so there's this really, of course, interesting interplay between science and engineering, right? So we understand about the microbiome, but then we need to develop technologies and tools to try and, uh, uh, um, and apply that science and knowledge. And so this is an image, um, I don't know and if any of you can guess what this is, what this represents. Anybody here want to take a guess? Really, this, this, is, this is a process that I think many of you are, are, are studying, I'm guessing, for those of you doing microbiome research. Any guesses? So this is, this is an artistic depiction of a fecal matter transplant, okay? Um, which to me is, uh, this is one of the best pictures I've ever seen of a, of a fecal matter transplant, um, which is really elegant and, and a lot more beautiful than probably the real life uh, depiction. Um, but, but again, you know, uh, through our understanding of the science of the microbiome, folks have been really able to start doing some really interesting research. So um, one, of the, one of the key ideas, of course, with a fecal matter transplant is that you can actually uh, perform a whole ecosystem transplantation of the microbes in the gut. And so some colleagues at MIT uh, set up a nonprofit entity called Open Biome, which is the first public stool bank. And so the idea here is that um, uh, you know, donors could be screened for their, their stool, which ultimately could be used in, in therapeutic purposes. Um, my colleague Mark Smith, who helped to found the Open Biome, um, has told me that um, the percentage of people that actually uh, can get their, their uh, stool into Open Biome is something around four or five percent. And so at MIT, I think the acceptance rate for undergraduates is like seven or eight percent. And at Harvard, I think it's even lower, like five or six percent. So if you can get your poop into Open Biome, you have extremely elite Poop, poop, basically, is the message. Um, and so, so, and you know, it's funny that I think they, they, you can, for each sample, they'll give you like 40 US dollars for, uh, for each sample. So, you know, I've, I've given this talk before to undergraduates and they're like doing the math and they're like, huh, it's like 30 or $40,000 a year, you know, just for my, my, my poop. So uh, I don't think I've inspired any, or, or this work has inspired any career changes, but, uh, but again, pretty, pretty, uh, something interesting to think about at least. So, um, so, uh, my colleague Eric Alm, who's the, the director or the co-director of the Human Microbiome Center at MIT, of course, though, has said, right, you know, fresh stool ultimately is a poor drug, right? You ultimately really don't want to be using, uh, you know, stool from a donor, uh, ideally, um, because of a variety of concerns. What would be more amazing would be if you could actually have something more kind of like an apothecary, where you could actually take different organisms that you cared about and actually construct rationally different types of communities. 
And so uh, what we did, this is uh, work when I was still at, at Lincoln Laboratory at MIT. We thought, you know, could we actually try and create something like an artificial gut, right? Could we actually create uh, a type of a structure that had a lot of the wonderful uh, physiology represented in a real gut, but do it in a type of an in vitro and artificial environment? You know, the real gut has all these three-dimensional structures and all of these different gradients uh, from bacteria to pH and oxygen. And so uh, one of the ideas was to leverage um, cutting-edge 3D printing to try and use that as a tool. And one of the ideas here was the idea with, was, was that um, with some of the more sophisticated 3D printing technologies, you can actually control the material composition of your print in three dimensions. So arbitrary voxels could have a different material composition to create different types of graded structures. And so my colleague at the Media Lab, uh, near, um, Professor Neri Oxman, has done some really amazing work um, uh, at the forefront of 3D printing to create structures like this. This is Mushtari, which is a microbial wearable. This is an artifact that you could wear and the idea is that organisms could be cultivated inside this, this wearable that could respond, for example, to, uh, to um, light and produce different types of compounds. So this is uh, really more of an art and design project. Um, but again, um, at Lincoln Laboratory, in collaboration with the Media Lab, um, we worked on trying to build this, this, uh, this three-dimensional uh, 3D printed gut, which could have a soft material that could be used for, for peristalsis, for pushing a semi-solid materials, and with these finer graded structures where microorganisms could live, and then um, a larger structure for uh, creating different types of um, environmental gradients. So these are just an example of some of the projects we've worked on over the years. And so you know, one big theme, I think, for me has been this question of how do we ultimately make these tools uh, more broadly accessible to very, very di diverse communities all around the world. And so um, I've been a big, big, very big believer and advocate in open source. So the idea that we should be, to the extent that we can, doing research in an open and transparent way and to share um, our insights as deeply as we can. And so um, for the past couple of years, I've taught this course called Open Source Fluidics for Synthetic Biology at MIT. Um, and again, I'll highlight a few folks here. Um, this was a former student of mine, Will Patrick, who um, before this class had actually never been in a wet lab before, had never done any pipetting. And a few years later, um, he's now the CEO of a wonderful company called Culture Robotics, which is, actually builds bioreactors. Um, this is uh, Julie Legault, who was a designer um, and who also um, had no wet lab experience. And, um, and for her master's thesis, basically uh, wanted to explore the idea of a Tamagotchi for bacteria, right? The idea that we should develop empathy for the bacteria of the body or bacteria in the world and that we should try and take care of them, much like in a Tamagotchi you can take care of a, of a digital animal, right? And so I, I point this out just to say we're in a really amazing era now where uh, folks that come from different disciplines like design, um, like the arts, can come in and actually make a real impact on the life sciences, which is something I think is really important. And so um, in the context of this course, um, we leveraged some commodity 3D printing tools to basically build 3D printed fluidics and we miniaturized in these 3D fluidics uh, genetic circuit assemblies. So we built uh, a bunch of uh, DNA molecules and tested them. Um, and again, this is uh, just a slide showing some of the design iteration of some of these fluidic tools. Um, a lot of this work was done by Will Patrick. And it's really beautiful, and again, I think gives you a sensibility. I, I know for myself, um, somebody that's not trained in design, I don't think I would have been able to come up with some of these beautiful uh, structures that, that Will, uh, Will created. And so uh, we published some, some really neat papers on this work together, and uh, uh, we had a lot of fun doing it, uh, which again, I think is really important. We got, it's very important in life to have a lot of fun. And, um, and over the years, again, we, th through this course, uh, we've been able to prototype different types of 3D fluidics, uh, but also for, for example, prototyping microbial communities like the work I shared earlier. Um, and so one of the big things we focused on, though, is ultimately sharing all of this work. So again, this is a, um, a paper from, from a couple of years ago in, in Nature Biotechnology, where we built a large repository of all of these design elements called metafluidics. And the idea is to basically create a, create a, create a, um, a repository that's sort of like Thingiverse, if those of you have interacted with that before, um, where you can go to this wonderful site, and I encourage you to go check it out, and all of these designs for these different microfluidic systems are there. Um, you know, when I was in graduate school doing work in microfluidics, I was always very frustrated because I would look at a scientific paper and I would try to reproduce some of the work from a colleague, and I had to, I was literally looking at a little, little image inside of a, of a journal article, and I didn't have a real design file to work with. So uh, through this, this site, we've been able to create uh, a really wonderful global community. I think there's several thousand users now um, that uh, have downloaded and interacted with um, the different material on the site. So, Again, this is a big part, I think, of, of uh, where we're headed is these type of large open source communities that can share uh, insights globally with each other. And so given all of this, right, um, you know, what does the future look like? Where are we headed? Um, I, I shared with you a little bit about, oh, 
sorry, I jumped ahead. I shared with you a little bit about Ginkgo Bioworks, which is, uh, again, uh, one of the, the major synthetic biology companies. And to date, I think we're still in an era where biotechnology is still really for, for the privileged few, right? Um, here at the NIH, at places like the Media Lab, places like Ginkgo Bioworks, we're privileged enough to be able to work in the life sciences and work with biotech. But this, I think, if you want to think about the analogy, analogy to computer science, you know, it's still early days, right? Um, this, is, again, is, is an image from uh, one of the uh, biofabs that Ginkgo Bioworks has, which is one of their major fabrication uh, facilities. And this picture, I think, is really similar um, to this picture, right? Um, I don't know if th those of you in the audience uh, know what this is. Um, but this is the ENIAC, right? This is the very, one of the very first mainframe computers. And uh, I, I love this kind of comparison, right? It's, it's um, in many ways, you know, we are kind of early days with biotech. And, you know, going back to Nicholas's statement about um, biotech is the new digital, um, I think we're really in this historical moment now where we have the opportunity to try and educate uh, the world about what's happening with the life sciences, right? Which is so critically important given the power of this technology. And so there are a lot of ways all of this can unfold, right? Um, I don't know how many of you watched this TV show, Westworld. Um, a few of you. Uh, so so uh, um, I, I'm real privileged to know uh, the creators of this, this show. And, and again, it's, it's a really great TV show. I personally love it, but it's really scary, right? It maps, it's this depiction of a pretty dystopian future where um, the folks that have all of this advanced technology from the most advanced 3D bioprinting to synthetic biology and uh, artificial intelligence, um, that there's a really asymmetric distribution of of these resources, right? And to me, the question is, how do we take the life sciences and synthetic biology and biotechnology and ensure that the future looks something a little more like this, right? So this is a, a photograph that I took uh, at my community center in uh, Central Square in Cambridge called EMW, right? Where at, at EMW, we have these incredibly diverse communities, right? We've got folks that are uh, um, socioeconomically diverse, culturally diverse, and, uh, and to me, you know, my hope is that we can really bring the life sciences and synthetic biology and biotech to, to all of these folks from all around the world. And so this is a question that, I, that I, um, in our initiative we think a lot about, which is how do we ultimately ensure that we have broad, diverse participation? And so, one first question to ask is, you know, why is diversity important, right? Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of wonderful social scientists that, scientists that have studied this. And basically, the social science has shown that diverse groups actually can outperform, uh, quote unquote, high ability problem solvers, right? Um, this is uh, my colleague, Kareem Lakani, who is over at Harvard Business School and leads the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard. Uh, Kareem is also a hip-hop guy, so I love Kareem. Uh, really, really awesome guy. We're, we're collaborators. And Kareem, in his research, has introduced this really powerful idea called technical marginality, okay? So the basic idea here, uh, and, I'll, and I'm going to read you a, a sentence um, that explains this idea. So what Kareem and his researchers did was they got groups of, together, of people together to basically solve uh, uh, problems, and what they found was that the provision of a winning solution was positively related to increasing distance between the solver's field of technical expertise and the focal field of the problem. Said another way, if you're trying to find a disruptive or creative solution in a field like biology, for example, actually the likelihood of a, of a quote unquote winning solution, you should try to find somebody as far away from biology as possible. Right? That people actually farther away from your field are more likely to come up with an idea that's more orthogonal, more, more innovative and creative. Because again, they're not part of the establishment, part of the set of ideas that everybody's already thinking about. And a parallel idea is called social marginality. Right? And so again, here, um, as a part of the study, they found that if you consider a scientific establishment, which again is largely male and largely often white men, um, in this particular study, they looked, they, they looked at female solvers, and they found that by introducing more women into groups, that those groups also performed uh, much better, right? So, so this all is, is kind of a part of the social science that, for me, is really exciting thinking about why diversity is important for innovation. Um, I know this um, anecdotally through guys like this. So this is Drew Endy, who is uh, one of my, uh, my colleagues and mentors, who's one of the founders of the whole field of synthetic biology. And Drew was a civil engineer, okay? Drew was a guy that built bridges and uh, thought about the, the built world. And he asked himself, why can't I engineer a cell the same way I can engineer a bridge or a building, right? Um, again, this is, this is Tom Knight, who is a computer scientist and electrical engineer. And Tom asked the same type of question, right? Why can't I engineer a cell the same way I can engineer a computer? or program a computer. And so it took a bunch of non-biologists, basically, to come into the life sciences and help create, essentially, what is now a major, major field of research, synthetic biology, um, which, again, has been growing uh, in a real significant way economically. So 
Okay, so we've seen at least in synthetic biology that bringing together these diverse creatives is important, uh, from, but, but these are technical creatives, right? So how do we move beyond technical diversity, right? Um, I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job, I think, as, a, an, as a, uh, an innovation community in the life sciences of bringing in engineers and computer scientists and other folks, but what about other types of diversity, right? And this gets to a more fundamental question, which is who gets to create? Who ultimately has agency in the life sciences, right? Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of what happens in the life sciences happens in, in corporations, it happens in places like uh, uh, MIT. Um, but one really kind of amazing thing that started to happen uh, in the late 2000s was the emergence of something called do-it-yourself or DIY bio. Um, and so uh, this was a really kind of a global trend that started right around the same time, around 2008, 2009. And you know, a lot of it, I think, was driven by uh, folks that looked at synthetic biology and said, you know, why can't I participate in synthetic biology, right? Why can't I also be involved in the life sciences? And so laboratories started to emerge in some really interesting places, right? So this is uh, my colleague, Rob Carlson, um, and this is him uh, shown in cartoon format inside um, his garage, right? And here he is with his PCR machine and his microcentrifuge, also his washer dryer right over here all in his lab. And so this quote is, the era of, of garage biology is a harness. Do you, uh, do you want to participate, right? And so, um, you know, so this idea of people uh, kind of doing bio biology in garages, you know, I think some communities or some folks are, are alarmed. Other folks are really excited, actually, right? I go back to this whole idea of innovation at the edge. Um, and, and again, it turns out, historically, that there have been some pretty cool things invented in garages, right? I don't know if you, you know who these two guys are, um, but these are two very famous Steves, right, who are involved in helping to uh, invent the personal computer. And actually, there was this really interesting uh, study or, or report that I saw that, um, that referenced the idea that in the life cycle of almost every major innovation, that a garage has been a part of that life cycle at some point, okay? So, uh, so this is a photograph that I took of uh, my boss, uh, Joey Ito, who's the director of the Media Lab. And you know, when Joey was first trying to get into synthetic biology, we tried to find a place for him to do this work. And it was really interesting, right? Um, you know, there's so many laboratories at MIT that, that um, do biology research, but the idea of having somebody like Joey, even though it is Joey and he's the director of the Media Lab and a, and a, and a really you know, wonderful guy, um, folks didn't want to have him there, right? Because this guy has never done any research before and now he's gonna come into our lab and do work next to our you know, BL2 tissue, cu tissue culture hood, right? You know, it's like very polite, like thank you Joey, but sorry. And so we actually ended up doing some of his first synthetic biology work in his kitchen, okay? And so, Ideally, he shouldn't be doing it as a kitchen. Um, ideally, um, there should be more community-oriented spaces where this type of work can happen, and, and fortunately, there are. So um, again, happened in around 2009 to 2010, where the emergence of these, what are called community biology labs. So these wonderful spaces where the public can go and can learn about synthetic biology, biotechnology, and really experiment and, and uh, have a, a really powerful experience there. So this is GenSpace in Brooklyn, uh, BioCurious in uh, Sunnyvale, um, again, for those of you that are, that are hip hop heads like myself, I feel like GenSpace and BioCurious are kind of like the, the Tupac and Biggie of, of, of uh, community labs, the, the East Coast, West Coast rivalry. Um, over here uh, in Maryland, actually, a big shout out to Bugs, the Baltimore underground science space, which does a lot of really wonderful work. And so part of what's exciting to me about the community labs is that they represent something with a different type of incentive structure than academia or corporations or government, right? In academia, we're trying to publish papers. We need tenure, right? There's a whole kind of system around that. And in for-profit corporations, you're trying to maximize profits for your shareholders. And um, in government, you know, spaces like the NIH, also very different motivations than what happens in a community lab, where there's a lot of freedom to really kind of be much more creative and be a little boundless in what you're trying to explore. Um, so folks in uh, places like GenSpace have collaborated with uh, academic institutions to do things like uh, s uh, sequencing the environment, urban environments in this case, and an example here of a pro project on the Gowanus Canal. Um, one of the real cool projects that has come out of the West Coast uh, community labs is this idea of real vegan cheese, right? Um, this idea that you could actually synthesize the milk proteins involved in dairy, but without having to use cows. Uh, or, or other dairy, or other animals. And so this, again, I think was, was really connected with the cellular agriculture movement, but it was really sparked in a community lab environment. And again, a lot of these labs have also been at the forefront of thinking about what is the quote unquote personal computer for biology, right? Could you actually have a desktop lab? Uh, Opentrons, which was founded by uh, uh, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Will Canine, who is at GenSpace, you know, he looked at liquid handling robots and said, hey, these are normally $100,000, $10,000 machines, very, very expensive and you know, uh, required a lot of expertise to use. Why can't I make a little desktop version of this that could sit in my lap, right? And you can get one of these for, for several thousand dollars now. 
So really wonderful projects, and even this one I love, Open Source Gender Codes from, from Bugs Lab, which I think was more of a speculative uh, type of design project, but was looking at how, you, how organisms could be engineered to produce hormones as an exploration of gender fluidity, right? And again, these types of projects, you know, they're really inspiring, and I think a very different type of, of, uh, of, type of work that you would see in, certainly in academia or in a corporate environment. Um, Glowing Plants, another really interesting one. This is one of the biggest Kickstarters of all time, uh, and this was done you know, many, many years ago in BioCurious, and now places like MIT are actually investing serious research dollars into trying to engineer a glowing plant, right, many, many years later. So, so the community labs, I think, are doing really interesting uh, and really exciting work. And we're starting to see these labs diffuse into all kinds of interesting spaces. So this is a public library in La Jolla, uh, where they've got a biotech lab. Um, this is the bio bus, uh, which I would love to ride on one day, uh, which, which uh, basically uh, you know, travels around and, and uh, brings science to the people. Uh, my colleagues at Little Devices at MIT have been setting up these different types of uh, maker spaces, bio maker spaces inside hospitals. Um, this is one of the cooler projects uh, that I, I'm, I'm so excited and really hope uh, comes to fruition, which is led by uh, one of my former students, Benno, from uh, Lima, Peru. And they're basically trying to build a floating bio fab lab, okay? The idea that this laboratory could actually float down the Amazon River and um, you could conduct different types of biological studies and also engage with the many indigenous communities that are on the Amazon. So really, really wonderful and very exciting and interesting places where the life sciences are now starting to emerge. One other really important institution uh, to mention is, is iGEM, which is the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. How many of you have heard of iGEM before? Okay, a few of you. So, this is basically like a giant synthetic biology science fair for nerds, right? Like thousands of students from all around the world at the beginning of the summer get a set of DNA parts, which they then use um, to engineer an organism to do something cool and interesting. And so this started out as a very, very small little class at MIT and has now grown into this really important global institution around synthetic biology education. Um, I've been involved with iGEM since almost the beginning, uh, and, uh, but probably my most important role that I play for iGEM is that I'm the official iGEM DJ. So um, I get to, I get to uh, rock the big party that happens at the end of each iGEM. Um, it's my favorite party I get to DJ all year, um, in part because you know, the students, they have so much energy uh, you know, pent up that gets to get released in this party, which happens at the, the night that the, the final competition ends. And uh, it's the only party that I've ever, ever DJ where I, I genuinely fear for my life because these you know, synthetic biology nerds are all crowding around and you know, it gets a little intense and crazy. It's also often at Halloween, so um, you know, just add that in there. So anyways, but it's a lot of fun, and this is kind of my thing is DJing for science nerds, so you know, if, you need, uh, if NIH needs like a science nerd DJ, please uh, sign me up. So this is some of the work that's happening globally, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the work that's, uh, that's been happening locally that I've been uh, um, working on over in Boston in the Cambridge area. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, I, uh, I also am the founder of a, uh, a community space called EMW, and the reason it's called EMW is in part homage to my dad, who is a professor at MIT in electromagnetic wave theory. So his three favorite letters were EMW for electromagnetic wave, okay? Um, and my parents also took over this, this storefront uh, in the late 90s, which uh, used to be a sex toy shop called Hubba Hubba. And they took it over and turned it into a Chinese language bookstore called East Meets West Bookstore, which is also EMW. And so when that happened, you know, the neighbors were very excited that you know, the, the sex toy shop was moving down the street and that you know, the Chinese academics and their bookstore were coming in, right? So, uh, so, so this, this, uh, this Chinese language bookstore was uh, um, uh, kind of doing its thing for a number of years before, before we had to kind of shut down for a little while. And in 2004 and 2005, myself and a number of other community organizers and social justice activists uh, reinvigorated the space and we started hosting open mics and uh, different types of uh, creative events uh, held in our space. And over the years, uh, we've really evolved into this, this wonderful art, technology, and community center, um, again, called EMW. And so um, I've had the honor of working, again, with, a, with really uh, wonderful um, uh, folks over the years in uh, organizing um, uh, our space and in doing organizing work for the community. And we've, we've really, I think, made an impact, uh, certainly in the Boston area, with folks that are working, for example, in poetry, spoken word, uh, you know, again, uh, in hip hop. Um, we have a wonderful program called East Meets Beats, which uh, engages with electronic music. This is the, the mighty and legendary Eloquent uh, from Canada. Um, this is Teclon, actually from, from the Maryland area. Um, uh, also jazz musicians. Um, this is uh, 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 Madame Gandhi, who is uh, MIA's drummer. Uh, one of our programs is called Beast Box, which is, uh, features some of the greatest beatboxers in the world. Um, uh, this is uh, some of our, our local artists who are, Tibet, are of Tibetan descent uh, doing a gallery space. And again, a lot of emphasis on, on social justice and street art. And so uh, 
And then this is uh, Juno Diaz speaking at our community library opening. Um, but all of that leading to, uh, you know, kind of the key connection to this talk, which is um, uh, the idea of democratized biotechnology and life sciences, right? So one of our programs is called Street Bio. And so here I am with, uh, well, here we are with some colleagues from the Media Lab uh, doing uh, synthetic biology inside our gallery space, right? And so, so we had this really wonderful, um, uh, a community lab that we've set up over the years, and again, in partnership with Ginkgo, if that's you're really given us a lot of the core equipment. And this is around uh, 2015, we started to set up our own community lab, where we've run all kinds of workshops and engaged with the public, uh, and we've also uh, you know, had these wonderful different art galleries, exploring the interface between citizen, citizen science and the arts. Um, and probably one of the programs that I'm, I'm most proud of is our Youth Science Initiative, where, again, we've been bringing uh, cohorts of young people uh, uh, many young girls of color and getting them excited about, uh, about uh, synthetic biology and the life sciences. And so this has really been uh, you know, a really, really fun experience uh, working with NASA and uh, astronauts like Katie Coleman to think about life beyond Mars. And uh, another one of key kind of educational in initiative that I'm a part of is a course called How to Grow Almost Anything, which we also teach in the context of our community bio lab. So I teach this class with, with this guy, George Church. Um, Hopefully you know George. George is one of the major figures in synthetic biology. <coughs> Excuse me. And this course is an exploration, in a way, of biotechnology across scales. So we start uh, teaching students about DNA design and then DNA synthesis uh, to metabolic engineering, tissue engineering, and then even ecosystem engineering. And so what's cool about this course, though, is that we teach it globally. So there's a network of what are called fab labs. I don't know if you've heard of uh, fab labs before. <coughs> and apologize. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just take a sip of water here. Um, any, has anybody heard of Fab Labs before? Okay, a couple of you. So um, this was a, um, a network of laboratories that was set up by my colleague at the Media Lab, Neil Gershenfeld. And the idea was, he taught this wonderful course called How to Make Almost Anything. And what they did in this class was they identified the minimal tool set that you need to make, quote unquote, almost anything. And it turns out if you have those tools, so things like you know, 3D printers, laser cutters, water jet cutters, you could actually make a bio lab, if you think about it. You could actually use your fab lab to make a bio lab. And so there are more than 1,500 of these fab labs worldwide. And so and Neil kind of tasked my, myself and George uh, with this, this, uh, this idea of trying to augment these fab labs with bio labs. And so, over the course of the past couple of years, I've had the great privilege of working with a variety of faculty around the world and also Jean-Michel Molinar up here in the upper left corner um, to teach this global class. And again, we, we do it by video conference, so laboratories from, from almost every continent uh, participate. And, uh, and again, this has all happened in, uh, in also in EMW. And again, you know, I, I think back to my parents and them getting this Chinese language bookstore. And you know, would they have thought that you know, 20 years later that George Church would be teaching a synthetic biology class there? You know what I mean? So it's really funny how, how the world works and how things unfold. But it's been really wonderful teaching this class uh, over the past couple of years. And again, um, you know, our community lab has participated, and I hope others will join. Um, and the students have generated some really amazing projects. So this is an, uh, a type of a, a project exploring the idea of a biosensitive tattoo that could respond to uh, different um, compounds being released through the skin. Um, this is another project, the Living Color Palette, which is uh, uh, led by uh, Yi Xiao Jiang. Yi Xiao is actually really amazing. She um, uh, found out about um, uh, the course through uh, the internet and moved to Cambridge from China, not knowing anything about biology. And now, again, uh, two years later, she is also the CEO of her own biotech company called Fela's Bio, or Felia's Bio. And they're also building a lab in a box type of tool. And actually, they're, they're launching a Kickstarter in just a couple of weeks. So uh, for me, it's been really, really exciting seeing all of these folks get into the life sciences um, that don't necessarily have um, you know, a lot of the same type of technical training and already in a couple short years being able to make a real impact. And so again, she's done a lot of wonderful work. Uh, we've made bioprinters, and, and this year, uh, again, I'm teaching this as a spring course at MIT. So this has all been really, really fun and, and something I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, very deeply. And so two years ago, uh, when I first uh, joined the Media Lab, right, to lead this new initiative, um, you know, one of the, the big things that I, I really was thinking a lot about was the whole global community that was working uh, on community bio and, and really trying to engage globally, right? Um, and so, so I started to kind of travel around and visit a bunch of different laboratories. So, um, and I had the real privilege in 2017 of going to Switzerland for the Biofabbing Convergence Conference, where I met so many incredible folks uh, working on community labs. Uh, folks like uh, Thomas, who is uh, uh, from Cameroon, and now a dear friend and colleague, 
Um, and so, so again, I think what I want to stress here is that there's an incredible global movement happening now uh, around um, these community labs and, and, these, and, and the fact that life sciences can happen in some of these uh, grassroots spaces. Um, this is Haquarium, which is in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, and again, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, I've had a real privilege of engaging with a lot of different folks, uh, including uh, law enforcement like the FBI. Uh, this is uh, the Synthetic Biology 7.0 conference in Singapore, uh, where again, this is Adeline, who's one of the major organizers in Southeast Asia. And so, um, and, and part of what I was doing was, you know, again, I mentioned I'm from Lexington. This was sort of my, uh, my community bio Paul Revere uh, moment, where I was really trying to round everybody up and say, hey, you know, we really need to converge and meet in person to have a, a gathering. And so all of this, uh, and oh, these, by the way, are photographs that, that I've taken. So this is when I was in uh, Tokyo in Japan in uh, 2017. It was one of the most amazing places to go to, to do street photography. Um, and so, so part of what I was doing was traveling to really try and get this global community to all come and, and converge at the Media Lab. And, uh, and that's basically what happened um, in October 2017. So um, that's when we organized the first ever Global Community Bio Summit. And so we weren't sure how many people would come to the, this first summit, but we ended up having you know, more than 200 participants from all around the world uh, come. And, and again, this was a really, it was a very transformational event, I think. Um, you know, as a community organizer, I, I, and this is a community of folks that works in, in the life sciences, you know, I organized this thing like I organized a retreat in my community center, right? So you know, really you know, all about heart. And, um, and again, I think you know, this is a social movement, which is another key part of this, which I think um, the folks here really care about you know, really trying to make a change in the world, right? Really trying to change the world. And, um, and so, so I think, you know, I've personally been so inspired by this global community. Again, I think uh, um, Beth was at this event as well. She's in this picture probably someplace. And so, so, uh, so you know, over the, over the past you know, year, and again, this is, this is still at, at the Bio Summit, all of these different labs from all around the world had the opportunity to meet and share. And it's sort of like having a family reunion with people that you didn't know were in your family, right? Um, and so it was a really transformational event. And, you know, one uh, type of word we used to describe uh, community bio is actually a movement, right? So it's not anymore just about an individual lab or an individual. It's really about what we can do together as a big global family, right? And so as a part of that, um, we started working very closely with, uh, with this guy over here. This is Marshall Gans. Marshall is a legendary community organizer. So he used to work with uh, Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King. Um, he helped to uh, lead the, uh, the organizing efforts behind Obama's 2008 and 2012 campaigns. And so we really started to deliberately employ uh, organizing tactics and thinking about how to structure this global movement. And again, a big part, I think, about uh, community bio and DIY bio is the idea of hands-on activities, right? So at the Bio Summit, we had all of these workshops you could take uh, to learn about, uh, you know, opentrons and um, all kinds of different things. Uh, and of course, we had a really awesome party, right? Very important. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is uh, George Church commenting on, on the historic nature of the 2017 meeting. So fast forward a year uh, to October, just this past October, and we had the, seven, the second uh, annual Global Community Bio Summit. And so for the second summit, uh, we almost doubled in size, right? So we had uh, more than 430 or so people that wanted to participate. In the end, around 350 or so folks came. And um, you know, this really is this incredible emerging global movement. And so, um, uh, again, uh, much like in the 2017 Bio Summit, uh, we had all of these different uh, hands-on wetware workshops and hardware workshops. Um, we had an ex exhibition where uh, we, we showed a lot of bio art and uh, bio design. Um, and again, just had a really uh, uh, you know, remarkable uh, event together. And so, but the key thing I want to emphasize, uh, and again, you know, great party, um, but the key thing I want to emphasize over the course of the couple of years is, I think, the idea that, um, that we are a global community and that actually, um, that actually there's a larger collective consciousness that, and a collective intelligence that's actually emerging in this global context. And so one of the big kind of questions, I think, is, you know, how do you ultimately structure and organize a global community, right? And so this is where, uh, for myself in the past year, I've had the real privilege of working very closely with the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. And so uh, Thomas Malone, who's the directs the center, has written a really wonderful book that I, I encourage you to check out called Superminds, which basically explores the idea that humans ultimately can be organized into different types of formats, right? We could be hierarchies, we could be democracies, um, and we can also be communities, right? And that these types of superminds, in a way, have a collective intelligence, right? An emergent behavior that uh, could be something bigger than the individual parts. 
And so if you think about a community, right, what brings a global community together, right? It's a really interesting question, I think, because there's no CEO, right? It's not like anybody has the power to say, like, hey, Genspace, go do this, or Bugs, go do that, right? In many ways, I feel like uh, the community labs are almost like this kind of armada of pirate ships, right? Everybody's doing their own thing, and uh, everybody's just going to do what they want to do, right? So in this type of a situation, how do you actually bring people together, right? And I think there are a couple of key things, right? So shared values are important. A shared vision is important. Having a shared set of ethics and norms and needs. And what we did at this last BioSummit 2.0 was we tried to make some of these implicit things explicit, right? So we actually ran a series of exercises to try and explore those different dimensions. So uh, one thing we did was we actually um, did an analysis of a set of, the, of uh, participants and looked at their values. So we collaborated with uh, Gunther Weil, who's a, a scholar and, uh, and a coach at the Media Lab. And uh, we basically did a bunch of work analyzing um, some of the values of our community, which I thought was a really cool thing. And you can see some of the you know, wisdom, the search for the under, uh, trying to understand the world, uh, pioneerism and progress, collaborative individualism. These are all some of the key values of our community. Um, ethics was very important, so we had a series of eth ethics exercises where folks could engage with a uh, different type of a question and uh, try to understand what uh, the range of, uh, of ethical positions could be uh, taken in our community. Um, we had folks sharing what different types of needs their labs had. And one of the coolest things that we did, I thought, was we had an exercise where we had, you know, again, probably 300 or so people contribute to a shared vision exercise. And this, again, was led by uh, Marshall Gans, but also Abel Kano, who is uh, one of Marshall, works very closely with Marshall as a core community organizer. And so we went through an iterative process where first the organizers of the BioSummit came up with a first draft of a statement. And then at the BioSummit, we had groups of around 50 to 75 people develop a second version, and then finally, excuse me, we leveraged some digital technologies to ultimately have several hundred people con contribute to the third version. And the final version um, I'll read to you now is something that I, I'm personally really inspired by and, and find a lot of, um, um, just, just, just a lot of inspiration for. So um, this, is, this is the shared statement, uh, statement of shared purpose that we came up with. So it reads, our shared purpose is to fundamentally transform the life sciences and democratize biotechnology to inspire creativity and improve lives by organizing life science changemakers and bioenthusiasts to build an inclusive global network, cultivate an accessible commons of knowledge and resources, launch community labs and projects, and enable local educators. Right? I don't know what you guys think about that statement. Um, but I, I personally found it really, really amazing. And you know, when we when we announced it at the very end of the bio summit, you know, it was one of the uh, kind of Key, key moments, I think, of the whole event and something I was very proud to experience. So um, building off of, of last year's summit, uh, we have BioSummit 3.0 coming up in October, so please mark your calendars. I hope many of you will, will come and attend. It's October 11th to 13th at the Media Lab at MIT. And, um, and again, you know, when we work with, uh, working with uh, the folks at the Center for Collective Intelligence, we've been thinking about how this global community might be able to do science in a new type of way, right? Produce knowledge in a new way and generate technologies and share knowledge even in a new, in a new type of way. Um, I want to give a shout out to my, my uh, friend Sebastian Kokiaba, who's also a colleague and a plant geneticist, and he's trying to engineer a blue rose, okay? And he actually has a lab in his home, and what he does, which is kind of amazing, his lab notebook is his Facebook feed, okay? So literally, I, you know, I wake up in the morning, I, I have my cup of coffee, and then I read what experiments uh, Sebastian's going to run that day. And part of what's amazing about this is that Sebastian shares everything, right? So, all of the mistakes that he's making in the lab, he's asking questions, how do I do this? Does anybody know what's wrong with this? And to me, you know, it's a cool anecdote, but I think a sign of what science really potentially could be like, right? Something that is more vastly open and transparent. And if we could get the incentive structures like, uh, right, then maybe it could be something like this. You know, I think NIH has actually conducted some studies uh, looking at um, the financial impact of reproducibility, right? The idea that somebody published a cool, you know, nature or science paper, and now somebody else is trying to reproduce that result, and, they, it's, and it's, it turns out it's extremely hard to do and sometimes not possible, right? And so, to me, the idea that we could have a type of science where we're sharing our failures and the things that don't work is actually really exciting to me, right? And so part of what we're doing is we're trying to build out um, a, a platform called community.bio where we potentially could have the global community interact with each other but also share science and scientific insights potentially in a new way. So after the first bio summit, we ultimately started spinning out um, there were, there were basically different regional types of events that were inspired by the summit that got organized. So um, in Africa, there was a wonderful open science event uh, called the African Open Science and Hardware Summit. Um, this was my first time going to Ghana, to Kumasi. And it was so inspiring to see, again, um, all of the, the folks there that are really trying to bring life sciences, in this case, to Ghana. Uh, this is my colleague Andrew Kripmeyer with his backpack laboratory. And we did a bunch of uh, work inside the local uh, botanical garden. 
Um, I, I, this is the first time I ever held, um, I forget exactly what animal or creature this is, but it was pretty intense and awesome. Um, and so, so again, you know, we've been working now with colleagues all around the world to try and help build out uh, these community labs. And uh, you know, again, over in Europe, there's been a lot of really exciting work. Um, this is uh, one of my colleagues, Winnie, in Ghent in Belgium. Uh, over in Barcelona, they have wonderful spaces, and I was recently had the privilege of going to uh, Southeast Asia, to Thailand, uh, to speak there and engage with uh, Freak Lab, which is one of the uh, really uh, up-and-coming spaces over in, in near Bangkok, or, or south of Bangkok. Um, these are friends from uh, the Tentacles Gallery in Bangkok. Um, and so, so again, you know, there's this incredible global network of folks that are starting to uh, really work. And part of what we did to try and bring this, this whole movement to the next level is to establish a fellowship program, which we call the Global Community Bio Fellowship, where we've identified 36 emerging leaders from around the world and are really trying to build a leadership cohort to work together to, uh, um, to really uh, bring um, uh, community bio to the next level. So, all of this to say, in my closing uh, little period here, um, I want to talk and bring it all full circle back to the opening of my talk, which is the connection between uh, biotechnology and culture, right? Um, so there's this interesting and maybe alarming set of polls looking at the difference between what scientists think about uh, uh, certain, uh, certain topics in science and what the public thinks, right? And um, there are a lot of significant gaps there that are pretty alarming. And so, you know, to me, one of the big questions is, uh, going back to this whole question of what's the Hamilton for, for the life sciences, you know, how do we ultimately culturally engage with these diverse communities? And so, this is a photograph that I took of uh, Professor George Church uh, from the March of Science in Boston. And George is the subject of a book that came out, um, I believe, maybe even two years ago now, called Wooly. How many of you have read Wooly or are aware of Wooly? Okay, so I I've been giving you guys a good, a good reading list, so hopefully you go check this out. Now, Superminds is one, Wooly is another one. And so this is a book about George's lab's effort to de-extinct the woolly mammoth. Turns out there's a variety of important reasons, including for climate change reasons, why we want to de-extinct the woolly mammoth. And, um, What's cool about the book, I think, is that the scientists here are actually the heroes, right? It's not a book about contagion or outbreak. This is actually um, a science in a, in a real positive way to impact the world. And so there's actually going to be turned into a huge movie, like a $100 million movie uh, that's going to be released uh, relatively soon, I think in the next year or so. And so there are a bunch of actors they're exploring to play George. Anybody, any, idea, any guesses on who would be play a good George Church? What was that? What was that? Himself? Okay, that's one answer. So there are a couple actors they're looking at to play George. One is uh, Jeff Bridges, who would be a pretty good George Church, I think. I'm, I'm being totally serious. This is Je Jeff Bridges' is one. The other one that I think is also would be really, really good is, uh, and, and the, this is the other active person they're looking at, is, uh, is Tom Hanks, okay? I'm being totally serious. Castaway Tom Hanks is, is, you know, he's got that classic twinkle in the eye that George has, right? So, so but, but again, I think there's a real, real cultural impact that, um, that can happen for the life sciences through things like Wooly and, and this potential movie, right? And again, uh, bringing it back to DNA Day, right? I think what you all are doing here uh, through, NH, through, through the work here of setting up the National DNA Day, I think is incredible. And why folks like, uh, you know, Korean pop stars like BTS uh, can play a positive role in getting the word of DNA out into the world and Kendrick Lamar, right? So. Uh, and, you know, again, this quote, innovation connects with culture, right? And so I'll conclude by, by telling about a project that we, we uh, created in my community lab um, where we asked an interesting question. I told you about microbiome science, right? I shared with you some of the engineering platforms we developed. But we asked ourselves this question. We said, you know, what does your microbiota sound like, right? What if we can make music from your microbiome? And we made this project called Biota Beats, which is a microbial record player that translates data about uh, the microbes of the body into sound and music. And so this is a, uh, you know, an image of a DJ scratching a vinyl record. Again, you know, I, you know, that's something I, I enjoy. And this is a, a DJ scratching a biota record, right? Um, note the, uh, uh, the gloves and the good sterile technique, right? Um, and so, so part of what we were doing with Biota Beats was to create this system that was actually built on a retrofit um, record player. So we, it's basically an incubator built on a record player. And, um, and basically we have these Biota records where we sample organisms from the body and as they grow over time, we collect data about the organisms and then have a series of algorithms that turn that data into sound and music. And so, um, so this is an uh, image of some of our Biota records which are actually set up to look like real EP and LP records. And this is uh, Annie, who's from our, our community, you know, sampling some of her, her toe bacteria and, uh, and, and inoculating uh, a biota record with that. And again, you know, we, we tracked a variety of different data streams to try and uh, um, uh, create, ultimately, this microbial music. And so, um, uh, are you guys ready to listen to some biota beats? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, let me play for you some, uh, some microbial music and tell me what you think. So...
This is a uh, uh, feed bacteria. Um, I won't say anything out loud about this, but you know, some menacing sounds uh, from this ecosystem of microorganisms. This is the belly button. The sound of armpit bacteria. This is the oral microbiome. And if you put it all together, it sounds uh, something like this. think cool. so so again uh, you know we had a real incredibly diverse group of uh, folks work on this from artists to designers to technologists and um, what we did after this kind of initial demonstration and again you know this is really more of an art project again I think part of it maybe we can collaborate with the NIH actually to really get into the, you know deeper into the science of, of uh, what biota beats could do but we asked ourselves a question. We said, well, you know, people have, have uh, you know, vinyl record collections, right? What if you could have a biota record collection? Like, what if you could actually sample organisms from really cool artists and make music out of their bacteria, right? So uh, this is a photograph that I took of Q-Tip, who's one of my all-time favorite MCs and DJs. Uh, this is a photograph that I took of uh, Questlove, again, another one of my favorite DJs. And so um, uh, I had the opportunity, I was, I was speaking at this event with uh, this guy. I don't know if you know who this is. Um, so you might recognize him more from this picture here. So this is DJ Jazzy Jeff, who's one of the legendary icons of hip hop. And uh, I was speaking at the same event as DJ Jazzy Jeff, and, um, and I brought basically a little DIY lab into uh, the green room. So I set up a little lab there, and I, and, I, and I found Jeff, and I asked him, I was like, Jeff, you know, uh, I've got this project we're working on called Biota Beats, where we're making hip hop beats out of people's bacteria. Uh, can I have some of your bacteria? And uh, Jeff looked at me and was like, that's one of the weirdest questions anybody's ever asked me, but yeah, I'm down, right? So instantly I was like, Jeff is basically the coolest person I can imagine. And, and so Jeff, this is Jeff you know, here, uh, basically sampling some of his oral microbiome. And, uh, and this is basically, I think this is one of my favorite photographs I've taken of all time. Look at how happy DJ Jazzy Jeff is inoculating this LB uh, media with uh, some of his oral microbiome, right? So, so he really, really enjoyed it. And um, uh, you know, we worked on making a biota beat from, from Jeff's bacteria. And probably one of like, the, the, the highlights of my scientific career, honestly, I got this call from uh, Jeff's manager um, you know, one time where, and, and basically she said, hey, you know, Jeff is about to go on tour uh, with Will Smith for the first time in like 10 years or whatever. You know, everybody's on pins and needles. And, uh, and we've been learning from you about how the microbiome is dynamic and responds to, you know, stress and all these other things. You know, what if we could make a biota beat of Jeff before he went on tour, after he went on tour, and during tour, and saw how the music changed? And I was on the other line of the phone, you know, kind of just crying like tears of joy, you know? It's like this, 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 you know, this major kind of hip hop icon and their team were proposing like a, a rigorous scientific you know, experiment, basically, right? And so, you know, to me, what this showed was that, you know, music ultimately is this universal language, right? And if we're gonna make the Hamilton of science, I think something like this, like Biota Beats, could be an inspiration for that, right? Um, people, young, young kids especially, ask like, hey, what does my microbiome sound like, right? All of a sudden, there's an, an engagement and excitement about the microbiome that people might have thought about before uh, with this project. So, um, you know, again, uh, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of interesting and cool press about this, uh, uh, about Biota Beats. And, but probably one of the more interesting things that we did was, uh, um, I guess, a year and a half ago now, 
So you remember iGEM, I told you about that, you know, 3,000 students from all around the world. And we basically worked on creating a song, which we called Universe, meaning one song. And again, this is this whole idea about thinking about a big global family. And that's what, what in part, what iGEM is too, much like Community Bio. And what we did was, we, we wanted to sample the microorganisms of these students that were from all around the world, and basically from that data, cr to create a global song. Okay, and so this was really crazy. Um, we had an incredible group of students working on this over the course of, a, of a, basically 72 hours, where we had one day where we were just sampling you know, uh, microbiota from the students, and then we would incubate them, and then uh, these, these different plates, and then ultimately image them, and then generate this MIDI data, which uh, my, my dear friend and brother from another mother, uh, Chuck Kim, uh, who's a producer in Los Angeles, would then produce the, the final uh, composition, and, uh, and ultimately we generate this visualization. And so, we had more than 130, we had 131 teams contribute their microbes, and basically each continent represented a different body part and also represented a different musical instrument. So South America, in this case, where there were seven teams from there and they represented the scalp and, and uh, percussion. Uh, only a couple African teams, but they were holding it down with uh, the atmosphere and were sampled their hands and so on, right? So for each one of these different uh, continents, we had different body parts and different, different sounds. And so I'll conclude by, by just sharing with you some of the, the music from Universe. I thought was just a really beautiful way to kind of represent um, what the microbes of this global community look like. And so again, these are photographs of all the students that participated. And, um, and again, it was a, it was a, really, um, a really wonderful uh, song, I think, that we were able to create. And you know, the closing thing I'll, I'll share is, you know, I, I think right now, especially in the world, you know, there's so many challenges that we face as, as a society here in the United States, but also really as a global family. And I think you know, a big part of what I care about and through the work of Community Bio and through things like you know, institutions like iGEM, um, I, I think that there's something we can do together as a big global family and that trying to figure out how we can communicate with each other and um, really, really be inspired by each other and work together to tackle some of these challenges is uh, so critically important. So um, I hope that um, you've enjoyed this talk and I hope that you uh, have learned something about uh, synthetic biology and about the intersection of these different, uh, different cultures. And so um, I'll conclude by uh, just acknowledging some of the team members and folks that uh, have worked on all of this research that I shared. And again, all of, to all of the organizers of DNA Day. Um, so thank you all so much, and I'll leave you with this meme. So thank you so much again. Uh, David and uh, we just have uh, a small token, a certificate um, to give to you. And wow, again, like you. I said, um, you are. Uh, oh, okay. We'll move out. We'll move out. Okay, we'll move out. Okay. Okay. okay sorry. Pierre is directing, <laughs> directing us to move out. Okay. But he's coming back to be uh, part of the ECIB. So. <laughs> Questions if people have them? Thoughts, comments, responses? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, years ago, I was on a committee that had computer scientists and biologists, and it was about intellectual property. And the computer scientists had no concept of why the biologists were so protective of their information. Yeah. And so, when you're talking about the Facebook feed, I was just thinking, 
will biology ever sort of move to that open source thinking that innately seems to be in the computer science community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, um, I, for myself personally, that's something that I'm very excited about and something that um, I hope uh, can catch on more. Um, but again, I think to your point, you know, balancing these things with privacy, and we talked a lot earlier about consent, um, I, think they're, 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 I think there's a balance between trying to engage and have very, very diverse participation, but also making sure that we do it the right way, right? Um, again, I, I, think, I think one of the, the major tasks that's before us as a scientific community is public engagement, right? Figuring out how do we get the public more knowledgeable and increasing that quote unquote DNA literacy, right? Um, my hope is, you know, for DNA Day, right, that, you know, that this day and the fact that it is National DNA Day, well, actually it's on the 25th, right? Yes. Which is perfect. So, so I, on the 25th, uh, I'm, I'm giving another talk then, so I'm going to have proudly wear my DNA Day t-shirt, yes. right, just to kind of get the word out. Um, so, so again, I, you know, I think it's through initiatives like this that we can try to have that broader public engagement. Um, but I do think, though, that, um, you know, trying to balance out how we share with privacy and consent, I think, is, you know, a big part of, of what is in front of us. I'll ask a question. Yeah, go for so, it. So, uh, I guess I'll get on the mic so we can record yeah. it. So, my question is really, you're creating this global community, and have you found that there are, obviously we have challenges in this country, what are some of the major challenges you see in other countries in being able to create a global community around science? Yeah, that's a super great question. Um, you know, to me, I think one of the things I'm most inspired by right now are my colleagues uh, all around the world uh, you know, particularly in the global south that are, are really getting into, into the life sciences, right? And, you know, we were having some, ch uh, some conversation about this at, at lunch with some of the trainees here at NIH. And, you know, it's, imagine trying to set up a wet lab where, you know, if your thermocycler breaks, yeah. who's going to come and fix that right. thing for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, are reagents going to get shipped mm -hmm. to you? Do you have reliable electricity, right? All of the things that we kind of take for granted in a laboratory environment here um, in, in the U.S., for example, mm -hmm. Um, there's so many of these cha challenges and obstacles that, um, that are, face our colleagues in the global setting. And so I think um, I, I shared a little bit about the African Open Science and Hardware event. Um, and I think, you know, again, going back to uh, one of the other colleagues' questions about open source, mm -hmm. open science, I think, is such a big part of how, in the developing world, um, an impact can be made, right? You know, if, if uh, you have the ability to actually repair your own machinery because you have all the design files, then that's a big step, right? If you don't have to rely as much on the global supply chains that may not be as evident in, a, in certain parts of the world, then that's really important, right? Mm -hmm. So initiatives like Metafluidics, which I shared, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we've got all of the design files for our, our fluidic systems and folks can download those and actually uh, make edits and remix mm -hmm. and so on. And, and those, I think, are, are critical um, kind of infrastructure pieces that we need as a, as a global community to try and, and bring science to these, these diverse communities around the world. Yeah, is there a question in the back? Maybe inadvertent hand raise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, <laughs> for giving this lecture. And, yeah. Uh, we know where to find him, so if people have other questions that come up, we'll definitely get them. Yeah, please reach out. I'm on all of the, you know, you can send me an email or, or uh, you know, get in contact with me on social media. It'd be, be an honor to stay in touch with all of you. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, let's work together on, on let's figure out the Hamilton yeah, for, for science. I love that idea. That's something we gotta do together. Yes. So thank you all so much again. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you. <laughs>